Welcome to the third lecture on modern construction materials. We looked at atomic bonding in the previous lecture. We looked at how chemical bonds are formed and these chemical bonds lead to certain structures in the materials that we are going to discuss later. Today we are going to look at the structure of solids. As you know there are different phases of matter, solids, liquids and gases. We are going to look now at the crystalline structure of certain materials. Later on we look at defects that occur in these crystalline structures and we will also look at materials which are not crystalline that is they are glassy or amorphous. When we look at the different types of solid structures, we uh, have ionic crystals, materials which form through ionic bonds where we have arrays of ions of different charges positive and negative charged ions and these form ionic crystals such as those that we find in salts like common salt, fluorite and so on. In metallic crystals we have metal cations that are closely packed and this is what we see in metals including iron, copper and so on. In covalent materials also we can have crystalline structures where we have chains, sheets or three dimensional networks where there is packing of atoms and this gives a crystalline structure. The examples are silica, diamond, clay minerals and so on. We can also have molecular crystals where we have molecules held together by van der Waals or hydrogen bonds. They are packed together in a specific configuration and this we find in plastics such as polyethylene and other materials such as ice. One thing that is common in all crystalline materials is that there is an ordered structure. There is an arrangement that is repetitive and there is a dense packing. There are other materials which are not crystalline and they are generally called amorphous materials where you do not see a regular packing but there is an irregular arrangement of ions, atoms or molecules. Examples are glass, polymers that are amorphous and also some other materials which are generally crystalline could be transformed to amorphous materials such as metal glass or met glass here. The last class of solid structures are composite materials where we have different phases mixed together like one set of particles or fibers dispersed in a continuous matrix like we have in fiber reinforced plastics or we have aggregates or particles disposed in a cementitious mortar like we have in Portland cement concrete. We will start with the crystalline structure of metals. The metallic bond as we saw in the previous lecture allows the development of ordered structures, crystalline structures which are cations positively charged ions that are bound in a non-directional manner. That means that they are formed symmetrically and they grow in all directions and this can lead to closed packed structures. So, here we have a structure that is not so closed packed. So, you see here that there is a not a dense arrangement, it seems to be a random packing and if you go back to the condon morse diagram that we looked at in the previous lecture, we find that here we would not be at the bottom most point of this curve which signifies the minimum energy, but the separation now between the particles is more. So, we find that the interparticle separation is not R0 corresponding to the minimum energy, but little bit higher. A material will also always try to reach the minimum state for stability. This always happens in uh, all materials when we look at the structure. The structure will try to get the minimum energy level possible that makes it more stable. So, if we compare this case to another case where there is a dense 
regular packing you see that the particles are closer to each other and when we go back to the condon mohr's diagram here that we have in red we find that we will have a lower energy because the particle packing is such that the interparticle spacing is lower and you reach the most stable state or the minimum energy level so this is the reason why we have dense structures because we have regular packing that leads to lower energy because each particle is surrounded by several neighbors and the packing becomes regular and dense now let us see how the packing can achieve such a structure suppose we take ions and we represent them by spheres and we try to see how they can closely pack like we see in this diagram we for simplicity we are considering all the ions to be equal sized and incompressible balls and we can now put a layer or a plane of spheres like this so this would be what happens in one plane to have achieve a very compact structure which will give the least energy possible now we have to have other layers so we can have couple of cases let's say in the first one we have what we looked at in the previous slide the spheres aligned together in one layer that is the layer a we can have the next set of balls placed over the gaps in the layer a that is the layer b after that we can have two choices one could be putting the next layer on top of the position of the balls in layer a so that is what is called a structure ab 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 so this is a repetitive a and b structure or you can have this case where we put the spheres over the gaps on b so that gives the spheres located in ccc giving a structure what is called abc abc so these are two possible structures where you can have dense packing both these cases 74% of the space is occupied so this is one way to get dense packing and this we see in many materials the ab 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 arrangement is called the hexagonal close packed structure or the hcp structure we see this in metals such as magnesium zinc cadmium cobalt titanium you see the structure here this is called the hexagonal close pack structure the hcp structure where we have an arrangement in a hexagonal nature and each particle is surrounded in its plane by six other particles or cations in the case of metals the other arrangement the abc abc arrangement leads to what is called the face centered cubic structure where we have any atom or particle surrounded by these particles on its plane and on top also and if you see here you see a cube being formed by the different particles so this is called a face centered cubic structure and the metals that crystalline in the fcc structure include aluminum copper nickel lead silver and gold iron exists in this structure above 910 degrees centigrade it uh, it goes through a phase change at 910 degrees centigrade above this temperature iron exists in the phase centered cubic structure you can also have sometimes structures that are not as closely packed we saw that in the previous two cases 74% of the space was occupied when we consider uh, spheres put together in the two structures that we discussed we can have something called a body centered cubic structure where we have each sphere touching eight other spheres below and above so these are the parts of the eight spheres that are touching it this is called a body centered cubic structure 
where we have a particle in the middle and then you have a cubic structure around it. Here the particles or the ions are not as closely packed as the previous two cases we saw. Metals that crystalline the BCC structure include chromium, molybdenum, niobium, vanadium, iron below 910 degrees. As I told you before, iron goes through a phase change at 910 degrees Celsius. Below that, iron also has a BCC structure. Now, this is, this is not just a model, but in reality, we have evidence that the structure of the metals is of this nature. These are a couple of pictures taken from the book of Callister, where we see images of atoms produced by scanning tunneling microscopy, where we have on the left hand side a plane of gold. What you see there as bumps are gold cations. On the right hand side again we see a layer of copper atoms and again these uh, spherical bumps that you see are the atoms of copper in the nanometer scale. So, this actually is the structure of metals and that has been visualized in the previous slides in the form of spheres to make the point about the crystalline nature. Why do we have different structures? We already looked at different types of arrangements in crystals. Why do we have the different structures? Well, the structure adopted is that which gives the crystal the least internal energy. If you remember the discussion on the condon morse diagram, we said that always the structure will be such that the lowest energy is achieved and for that there is a certain interparticle distance or intermolecular distance. And the structure will be that which gives the crystal the least en internal energy for the conditions that the crystal is in. Now, a crystal structure that has the least energy at one temperature need not necessarily have the least energy at another temperature. We already saw the example of iron, which changes its structure at 910 degrees centigrade, having one structure above and one structure below that temperature. So, a crystal structure for one temperature need not give the least energy for any other temperature. And this change in structure, for example, what we saw in iron forms the basis of metallurgy, which deals with the transformation of the structures and forms of materials. Ionic solids also have a crystalline arrangements. In ionic solids, what we have is ions of same charge packed in layers. So, you have in ionic crystal structures arrays of anions with cations in the holes of the array. So, the arrays are made of anions and the cations fit into the holes between the anions. The geometry then which results depends on the ratio of the radii of the cation and the anion. That is this ratio between the radius of the cation and the radius of the anion. The best case or the most stable case is this, where you have the cation fitting exactly in the hole between the anions. So, all the particles are touching each other. So, it gives a close packing and a stable structure with the least energy. This is also stable because there is not much possibility of movement but this is above ideal, the ratio is above ideal. This is an unstable situation, where you have a cation which is much smaller than the space between the anions and this gives rise to an unstable structure and this will not last for a long time. So, when we continue to look at ionic materials, an example is sodium chloride, common salt, where we have the sodium and the uh, chloride ions distributed in an orderly structure. And the most stable structures are those where, as I said before, the ions are surrounded by as many neighbors as possible of the opposite charge 
as this increases the binding energy. They, this increases the attractive energy that keeps the solid together. It increases the total binding energy and it decreases the potential energy to a minimum. That is when the material is most stable. Now, again there is evidence of this that we can get from microscopy. These are different images taken from uh, the site of Manchester Material Science Centre. And here you see a grain of sea salt at different scales. This on the left top you see a grain of sea salt and next to it is an image that is closer. The bar that you see here is about few hundred microns. This is a closer image. Again you see you start seeing some of the grainy texture on the surface. When you go down this is now a scale of 20 microns and you see neat crystals, cubic crystals of salt like what we saw before in the uh, schematic diagrams. You see here the crystals of salt and this is now one crystal in the size of about 5 to 10 microns. So, you see here how the crystal of sea salt has formed and this is similar to what we idealized in the diagrams before. So, there is quite a lot of evidence from microscopy how these structures exist in the micro scale and now from what we have learnt in atomic bonding we can understand how these, how this structure forms and how it can lead to crystalline or orderly structures. We go on next to the third type of bond that we studied in the previous lecture, covalent bonds and covalent solids. We also know that covalent bonds are directional bonds as opposed to what we saw in ionic and metallic bonding, covalent bonds are directional and this is very typical of covalent structures. We saw in the previous lectures that covalent structures have chains or sheets. Within the chains and sheets you have covalent bonds and across them or between the chains and sheets you have weak van der Waal or hydrogen bonds. So, within the chain or within the sheet you have covalent bonds and between the chains and between the sheets you have weak van der Waal or hydrogen bonds holding them together. Only when there is an orderly structure of these chains and sheets, we have a crystalline covalent solid. Graphite is an example where we have covalently bonded sheets. This is a piece of graphite and within it we see that the carbon atoms are all aligned in sheets in an orderly manner these sheets now are held together by weak van der Waals forces. This type of structure gives graphite a lot of interesting properties. One is the softness coming from the weak intersheet bonding, the sheets slip one over the other and this makes graphite an excellent dry lubricant because the van der Waals forces can be overcome the van der Waal bond can be broken easily and starts slipping one over the other. Now, you can have carbon with covalent bonds forming a very hard structure also. The example is diamond where you have a network of covalently bonded atoms giving a hard strong structure opposed to the same element carbon in graphite which gives a soft nature because the way it is formed. So, to recap graphite is formed in these layers of carbon. Within the layer you have covalent bonds and across from between one sheet and the other we have van der Waals bonds. Because of this we have good electrical conductivity along the sheets and graphite is a good conductor electricity in two dimensions that is along the sheets not across, but along the sheets. Another 
set of materials that are covalent solids are based on silica and silicates. The silicate tetrahedron that we uh, saw in the previous lecture is a basic repeating structure in silica and silicates. The silicon ion is surrounded by 4 oxygen ions resulting in SiO4 with a charge imbalance of minus 4. This charge is neutralized when the oxygen anions are shared with other silicate tetrahedra to form chains and sheets. So, this is the silica tetrahedron with one atom of silicon in the middle surrounded by four atoms of oxygen and this can now link to form silicate chains. You have two types of chains that can form, you have the single chains or we can have a double chain structure. In either case what we find is long thin crystals are formed and these can be bent and be made into a fabric or a fibrous structure. One example is asbestos. Asbestos as you know has been used for a long time in insulation for reinforcing cement composites and so on. Now, it is not much used because it is uh, harmful to the health, but at one period in time asbestos was a very popular reinforcing material and insulating material that was used in civil engineering. Now, the tetrahedra can also form sheets. So, here you have a sheet structure where each tetrahedron now shares three oxygen ions with its neighbors forming these sheets which can be quite wide. So, this is the structure of the sheet formed by the tetrahedra. You can also have these tetrahedra making a three dimensional lattice. This is one of the exceptional covalent materials which has a three dimensional structure, the other being diamond which forms a three dimensional structure with carbon. Now, we have lattices of the silicate tetrahedra which can form a network structure like in quartz. So, quartz is a crystalline material that is made up of these tetrahedra forming a network structure like this. Now, one type of crystalline material that we find uh, in nature is clay. This is the structure of kaolinite, a type of clay which has a two layered structure. One layer is made out of the silica tetrahedra, this is the tetrahedral sheet. On top of this we find an aluminum hydroxide sheet which is octahedral and this fits in and it takes care of the charge imbalance and together they form a unit that is neutral. So, the kaolinite can be visualized, this is the formula of kaolinite. Kaolinite can be visualized as layers of tetrahedra which are SiO 2 O 5 linking up with layers of octahedral aluminum hydroxide Al 2 OH 4. Both have a charge imbalance, the tetrahedra have a negative 2 charge imbalance, octahedral aluminum hydroxide has plus 2 charge imbalance. So, they have an ionic bond which forms between the layers to give a single unit. So, the charge and the geometry fit, they match each other and together the two sheets form a 0.7 nanometer thick sheet, very thin sheets occur within kaolinite. Now, different sheets are bonded to each other by van der Waals forces which is a weak bond. Between the tetrahedral sheet and the octahedral sheet we have ionic bonds, but between this unit which forms a sheet and the next one we have van der Waals forces which are not very strong. So, that is this is what is shown here. So, you have one unit made up of SiO 2 O 5 and Al 2 OH 4 and between this unit and the next you have van der Waals forces which are not very strong forces. So, that is why these sheets can split 
along this direction you can have the separation of these layers in kaolinite. Kaolinite crystallizes as these flat sheets, but does not absorb water, but it can adsorb water as a thin external layer on the surface, but it is the type of clay which does not absorb water or expand. Another similar material is haloisite, which has water between the sheets as opposed to what we see in kaolinite. And these are some scanning electron micrographs taken from the book of Bowles, where we see the small platelets or crystals which form in kaolinite. These are the small flat sheets which make up kaolinite. Halocyte is more a tubular structure. You can barely see here some tubular structure because the halocyte sheets are rolled up like tubes whereas kaolinite crystallizes in these small flat sheets. There are three main classes of clays. What we have discussed up to now is a group called the candites, which includes the kaolinite and haloisite. These are two layered structures that we saw before or what is called the TO structure, meaning tetrahedral octahedral structure without any charge imbalance that is they are stable as such and the different layers of these materials are bonded by van der Waals forces which are weak forces. So, this is candite. Then we have another structure called smectite with clays such as pyrophyllite and monmorinite which have a three layered structure called the TOT structure tetrahedral octahedral tetrahedral structure and having some charge imbalance. So, there is some charge imbalance in this structure and this makes it such that water is readily adsorbed between the layers and once water goes in it leads to swelling of the clay and reduction of the strength. The bond between the different layers are lost and water makes it such that this these clay layers separate very easily. This is in the smectite structure. Then we have a third class of clay called elites. Muscovite is one of them, which also has a three layered structure, a TOT structure, but with potassium, calcium or magnesium cations between the layers. See here you see the TOT structure of muscovite with potassium cations between the sheets. Again, these potassium ions now fulfill the charge imbalance, but now they do not let any water go in. So, this is a type of clay which does not incorporate water and expands. So, this is a clay which does not expand. This is a non expanding clay, even though it has a similar structure to that of the smectites. So, what we have seen is you can have similar structures. But depending on the chemical nature of these structures, they can be either expanding, non-expanding and that is important for us to understand when we looked at, look at foundations and we look at soil mechanics and we want to build structures on such soils. To summarize about clays, clays crystallize as flat plates. These can cleave easily, cleave means they can separate easily along the weakly bonded planes. And what are the weakly bonded planes? Those that are bonded by van der Waals bonds. The other bonds are ionic that we saw before. So, that does not break so easily, but the van der Waals bonds break easily and the plates of clay can separate. Similarly, we also see in mica, which can also be separated into very thin sheets or cleaved into very thin sheets. One evidence that these plates separate easily is when you take dry clay and uh, you rub it with your finger and you see a slippery feel same as talc or what we call talcum powder. So, the platelets of clay slip over each other and that is why when you take clay powder in your between your fingers you have a slippery feel. Now, when we have materials generally they are polycrystalline like the whole solid is not made up of a single crystal, 
but a collection of small crystals and therefore, they are called polycrystalline materials. The diagrams below show you what are the different stages of solidification when we have a melt and we start decreasing the temperature of the melt. Small nuclei start to solidify and around these nuclei we see the growth of the crystal. So, here we are seeing the evidence of some sort of growth around the different nuclei and as the solidification continues each nuclei now grows into a large crystal and this grows without any hindrance, without any disturbance until one crystal meets another. So, when one crystal hits another or does not have space to grow, we have a grain boundary. Within a grain, the crystal structure is in a certain direction. In the next crystal, you can have a different crystal direction or orientation. Eventually, all the spaces are filled up and you have these grain boundaries that you see between the different crystals. So, each of this will be one crystal and between the crystals we have grain boundaries. This is an example of uh, the grain boundaries and the different crystals. This is an image from uh, the internet of an aluminum ingot about 5 centimeters wide as it has solidified and you can see here the all of this is aluminum but the different colors indicate the different crystals that have been formed. This is an ingot which would have solidified first along the edges and then you have radial solidification. So, you have these elongated crystals which have formed and finally, there is crystallization or solidification in the center. So, these different colors indicate different crystals that have been formed. Now, this is an image from the book of Callister again showing uh, a micrograph of brass showing its polycrystalline nature. Again, all of this is brass and the different colors represent the different crystals which reflect light differently because of the different ori orientation of the crystal planes and you see here how brass is made up of different different crystals or grains and between them we have the grain boundaries. So, within one grain the crystal structure is uniform and between one grain and the other you will have a discontinuity of the crystal structure. To summarize in the first part of this uh, lecture we have looked at different crystalline structures formed by either ionic, metallic or covalent bonding. We also looked at what properties we can expect from such structures and we ended up looking at polycrystalline materials. In the next part of this lecture, we look at defects that can occur in these crystals. Remember, we said crystals were materials which have orderly packing or a regular structure. Now, defects can also occur in these materials and this is what we look at when we continue with this lecture. And later on we look at structures which are not crystalline, they are either precipitates or they are glasses. So, these are called amorphous structures which can form, the amorphous structures by definition are irregular structures that can form in materials. Thank you.